So William Pepper called upon two of the young guys teaching in the School of Architecture, John Stewartson and Walter Cope, both of them in their early 30s, and gave them the job of building a dormitory big enough to house the 1,000 to 1,500 students that they projected for the entire university. So it was undergraduates, graduate students, everybody would be housed. But they wouldn't build it all at once. They'd begin at the full, far west end and just keep building. And Penn did build continuously to the evolving design that Cope and Stewartson created for them until the stock market crash in 1929. And then they filled in the last remaining gap in the 1950s. The building is by Cope and Stewartson, and most of you, if you know anything about Penn's architecture, probably associate those names with all of its buildings. And they did. The names Cope and Stewartson are associated with almost all, with the majority of the buildings that were built between the 1890s and the 1920s. Except, except that John Stewartson died in 1896 and Walter Cope died in 1902, before the majority of these buildings were built. They were continued by the firm called Cope and Stewartson. And so what you're dealing with, frankly, is a great university organizing itself on the industrial scale of the late 19th century, entrusting its architecture to a modern day architecture firm, a large multi-partner firm that continues to do business even when its partners die, um, in which the design work is done by other people. Um, it's necessary to think about the building um, as, one, as like the Furnace Library, a product of this intense uh, specialization that's going on. They be, th when they were hired to do this building, although they were very young, they had already designed several dormitory buildings at Bryn Mawr College. And if you know Bryn Mawr College, you know that the prevailing building stone there is Wissahick and Schist, gray stone, like the Houston Hall. And the initial plan was to build this building in Wissahick and Schist as well. But Stewardson was in England while the building was being designed. He took a summer trip and went to, went to Cambridge rather than Oxford. And Cambridge, there's no great building stone available in quarries near Cambridge. So a lot of the architecture in Cambridge is brick. And he was specially taken with St. John's College in Cambridge. And he wired home, telegraphed home to his partner saying, I think we really ought to shift to brick. Philadelphia is a brick city. This is an urban building, not a suburban building. And Houston Hall, well, the kids are doing that. Let's us shift to brick. And that's what they did. And they adopted a style that is plucked out of history at just the point when medieval is giving way to Renaissance. And if you look at that door head, for instance, you'll see medieval crockets on either side of it, if, and then in the middle, a classical pediment. Uh, you look up and you see Tudor towers, but if you look that way, you see a Palladian arch out of the Italian Renaissance. This is a building, how shall I say it? This is a building that is impure. <laughs> this, this, is a building, this is a building designed in the 1890s by architects who had been liberated by Frank Furness's generation from the idea of copying any one historical style. And they chose to combine and mix styles. Cope and Stewartson would go on to design half a dozen buildings for the, on the Penn campus. They are almost, all, each of them is in a different style from the other, almost, almost. Um, that, that variety is not symbolic of anything. It's just an expression of artistic variety, and we'll talk more about that architecture in a moment. This upper part of the quad, the, the quad has been reorganized in the last 20 years as three college houses. Um, uh, they are Fisher Hassenfeld College House, which is the upper quadrangle. The, the main, the big quad is Ware College House, including Memorial Tower. Um, and the two small quads, the baby quad and the, the area in front of Provost Tower, um, that is uh, Reapy College House. Um, the, um, uh, that transformation did come uh, with a lot of architectural work, rebuilding every bathroom, and also the really, well, I have to say, really wonderful landscaping that has, you know, you probably remember this place when it was a beaten, dirty, dirt field. And, and we, have, we, have, we have basically built an, an indestructible uh, uh, landscape here. Uh, one of the clever things it involves is curbs. You put a curb, people are less likely to walk on the grass. If you build the pair a little higher, it gets even higher. But anyway, so we're going to walk. We're go we're, we start here in 1894, and we're going to walk into the 20th century.
Um, we are now in 1909, and the first tower was dedicated to the Penn soldiers who died in the Spanish-American War, and it was dedicated in 1900. 1909, Provost Tower is dedicated to the provosts of the university, the leaders of the university. It's provosts, plural, provosts tower, and it was built in, in 1909. If you, look, uh, if you look into the baby quad, you'll see architecture from the 1920s. Um, there's, it's much simpler. Almost all of the stone detailing has disappeared. Don't have time to go in there today, but if you want to think about that as the 1920s and modernism beginning to take hold, you can see that right there. I want to tell you a story about this, the place we're standing now. Um, uh, President, uh, uh, Provost, Harrison uh, began to be, uh, took over from uh, Provost Pepper in 1894. Um, uh, Pepper went over to the University Museum and became its principal leader. Uh, and Harrison followed suit, and when he retired in 1914 from being provost, he went over to the University Museum also. Before he went, uh, the university undertook to celebrate him in a variety of ways. I should have pointed at his oil portrait in College Hall. But in 1908, what I think of as the most perfect celebration of him occurred. In 1908, uh, his wife undertook to make a gift to the university to celebrate her husband, to honor her husband. And she gave the university money to continue the building of the quadrangle dormitories. And she gave money specifically to build this house, birthday house, which was a birthday present to her husband or to the university honoring her, present, her husband, but it doesn't have his name on it. It's just a celebration. And I think that there's, there's something astonishingly personal and powerful about that. And to, cons and to think of the way that the university, which had begun in 1893 and just kept at it, you know, did not stop, and then continued into the 1920s. And then after the war came back and finally finished the job in the 1950s. Now that's an astonishing commitment to a vision, to an idea that's powerful enough to hold sway over that period of time. The architectural styles change. These buildings are now five stories tall and they are concrete framed. The upper quad is wooden framed. Um, and as I say, if you go into the baby quad, you'll see that almost all of the limestone decoration has disappeared. Well, those things change, but the commitment to the overall vision continues.